time. Thank you for sticking with us. We're almost done. But hopefully you're finding this program available yeah, on the software. It's not a recurring thing, but hopefully you will walk away with the, all the important information you need in terms of being a chair. Uh, and then, of course, we'll be in touch after uh, this semester. We have one more meeting. No. So today's topic and today's speaker is all about hiring your faculty and staff, full-time faculty as well as adjunct faculty. So that's our first topic, and then we'll uh, look at the uh, evaluation and who's responsible for this chair for your non-tenure faculty and all the components of that. So I'll, Jean B. Barty and I will take over that topic. But first, we'll have our Joe Klinger. Everybody I, knows Joe? Everybody, in the, everybody knows Joe? I think everybody knows Joe. That's, 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 my, that's my hope. Um, okay, so I was asked to come and speak with you all regarding um, hiring. You're all hiring managers as chairpersons of your department. And so I believe the first thing I would start off with is talking about uh, hiring. Most likely, what you most likely will be doing is part time adjunct faculty. Okay? So, I think the first thing you need to know is we can't hire anybody unless we have a job posting, okay? And so if you're interested in hiring an individual or you're looking to create a pool of adjunct faculty that you could choose from, you're going to want to have work with me to create a posting where interested individuals could obviously submit an application, their resume, cover letter, and teaching philosophy. And so for adjunct faculty, I gave you the adjunct job description. This is a collectively bargained job description um, that cannot be changed. It is what I will use or what my staff will use with every single job posting that we do for part-time faculty. When you request a job posting from me, I'm going to ask you for a few things. Um, the educational requirements that you're looking for, any particular preferred experience and skills, knowledge, certifications. Those are those are the items that we can work with for the most part that are uh, that's flexible and that we can work with the posting. The exact job description is right here. That cannot be changed. Um, now each of you will have to know what licensures, certifications, educational credentials are required for your particular instructors. Um, generally, it's a master's degree in the field of study or a master's degree with the 15 now, 15 or 18, there used to be 18, I think now it's a master's degree with 15 uh, graduate hours in your field of study. And then everything else, what you guys prefer, if it's licensure, you know, certifications if you're in health careers, um, those type of things, you guys will have to let me know and we'll create the posting for you, okay? We'll spend a little bit of money advertising, whether it's on higher ed jobs, inside higher ed, LinkedIn. Um, I got Indeed, I use a lot, Career Builder. And then each of you also have a lot of, particularly in your fields, like um, professional organizations that have job boards. We use, we'll use those as well. And so I don't have unlimited funds, but I have a healthy amount of funds for advertising. And I actually work with an advertising agency that's in Oak Park, and they will get positions posted on, on my behalf for, for a price, okay? And we hope that by casting a net out there, that will bring somebody in. I do not have a dedicated recruiter, somebody that goes out and sources individuals. So um, what I do is I try to put ads in as many places that I can where I get the best return on investment, and hopefully applicants will see those advertisements and, uh, and uh, lead them to our, our job board and actually apply for the positions, okay? I always appreciate help from chair people and deans to reach out to their networks. You guys have, if you're like me, you should have listservs and organizations that you guys belong in, and you're more than welcome to share those, those opportunities with individuals. There's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing illegal with it. So this is a... It's a, it's a collective team effort, and as much as I put a lot of the responsibility on myself and my team to get applicants for you, um, you probably most likely know more people in your field than I do. And so anything that you can help do to facilitate people to apply is always very, very much appreciated. Any questions thus far? 
Once we get our posting created, I, my staff will send you a link and login credentials so that you could go in and view those applicants as they're received. They become instantly available. So if they apply, you'll be able to see them. There's nothing that needs to be done by my staff to move them over, to activate them. They become instantly available for you guys to, uh, to see applicants that are reviewed. As the hiring managers, you're responsible for reviewing the resumes and identifying candidates that you want to interview. So you'll reach out to them, you'll contact them, you'll schedule the interview. They get a link to the website. Yes, yeah, 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 yeah that's why I, I just told them that, yeah. Um, the questions you'll ask, your dean's office has should have uh, what's called an adjunct faculty interview form, which Dean Bartley is so kind enough to have made copies. This is one of the reasons why I invited her. So, <laughs> joking. Um, and, and so these are some of the standard forms that we expect. Um, and so there's a list of interview questions that you guys should use as a reference when you interview people that you're interested in, candidates. I think it's important to talk to them about availability. Compensation is always on the posting, so if they want to know what they're going to be paid, that's on the posting. Right now, adjuncts are at 1000 thousand dollars per LHE okay that makes it pretty simple do the math okay if they ask if it's a four LHE course they're getting paid four grand three LHE it's three grand now it doesn't include it of course you know there's taxes that got to come out of that SERS comes out of it um, if they contribute to any other type of retirement vehicles that all comes out of it so that's what I gave you is gross and then we take out deductions out of that okay you're going to want to, when you go through all the interview questions, there's other things on there you want to make sure that if they, if they here's a good example of the interview questions. She gave it to you on the second page. You also want to make sure that they're willing to do the Blackboard Learn training. You guys, most of you guys are probably familiar with a lot of these forms already, right? They're willing to complete this. This is kind of like a contract. It's an agreement that they're willing to do this and get this completed within, I believe it's two, is it two semesters? This is, I should also know this, but within two semesters. Two regular academic semesters, excluding summer. And if they don't get it done, then they're, they're, just, they're unqualified to teach at that point in time. So make sure that's a firm thing. It's not compensated. That's another big thing. Okay, you make sure they know that, that we don't compensate them for the training. It's somewhat of a qualification that we believe an instructor should have already at that point in time when we're hiring them. And if they don't have it, then that's why they're doing the training. We're giving them an extension to complete the training. That's why we're not paying them for it. Any questions thus far? Um, yeah. So, I mean, the comment that you just made, they should already know that. Are you saying they should come in knowing how well, to our, do our, that? Our, for yeah, them? our hope is that people, that our instructors that are coming in know how to use Blackboard, are familiar with Blackboard, mm -hmm. uh, have gone through the training. And the tra truth is, most aren't. Yeah. Well, so especially I, in the healthcare, yeah. Yeah. our individuals aren't familiar with Blackboard. Right. But that's why the training, right? The ultra. Yeah, that's why we do the Blackboard training. Mm -hmm. A pedagogy training, yes. But they're not compensated to do it. Although we know that they probably have never used it. So a comment on that. I just had a conversation with um, another dean or day right after. And he said, you know, why are they compensated? I said, first of all, originally they were when we had this post-COVID, during COVID, right after COVID, they were. Um, but then it was negotiated with the adjunct contract. So the adjunct leadership is the one who negotiated. There's no more compensation. Also, um, while people come in thinking, oh, you're making me do this, 
these are the tools that you teach them. You could not walk into uh, a hospital, either of you, having been out of the field for a very long time, and say, I'm here, I'm going to start working. You would have to know how to use the technology. And this is no different here. They would train me. They would train me. Uh, they would train me. Should I just stop? Okay. I mean, they would train me. They, when I onboard new people at the hospital, they, they get trained on how to use our right. So we have training here. Also. But we pay them. They're on the clock. Yes, they're on the clock. And they're on the side here as well. Uh, I feel that. They're on the clock. Um, and you're coming in as part time, not full time. So this is a choice that you're making to come and work here. So if you want that extra money, because for most it's extra money, but they want full time elsewhere, take the training so you can continue. Mm -hmm. I also think we have to, we're not expecting it all about day one. For any of you that have done the ultra on, online course, mm -hmm. Shelly, do you have a number of hours it takes? Depends on the individual from people, but I will pay more than the year. Yeah, I've had people say, I have done the weekend. Yeah. People have done it in 10 hours. So, well, I have people doing the weekend. Both of them. Pardon me? I did yeah. both of them recently. Mm -hmm. Oh, did I? I'm just curious. Is this also um, full time faculty? Or it's just for the time? It's full time faculty, but those that are coming in new now, it's part of the time process. Right. Mm -hmm. so, but I would tell you, um, when we look at the list of who's qualified, it's almost every faculty member. I would say almost 90 to 95 percent of all my faculty are online. Whether they teach online, that's totally different. Um, but also, I think you have to think about if you've got the first part of the training done, again, in a week or two, you've got two semesters, a whole year, to get the rest of the training done. And then um, also, that over the time you're going to be teaching. It's a very short amount of training for a long period of time. And as you know, the pedagogy is not necessarily just about online, but the teachers will have to have a teacher. So, especially for those people coming into careers that haven't had a lot of teaching, mm -hmm. it's really supporting them to be a better teacher. So this is an investment, yes, they're making. It's going to pay off for them as well. I completely agree. And I, I get the compensation. But that was negotiated, I think. Mm -hmm. So and I, the edge was just negotiated, so I don't think that's going to reopen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just feel like I, I don't think that I could have started teaching this fall not having had the opportunity to do all of it before. So how early can we get the edge on in? Yes, as, as long as well, part of the going on in this is, is if, you're, if you could almost guarantee me I don't put them in the system unless I know we're going to get them a class. Because then I don't want what we don't want to do is we don't want to put a bunch of data in our system. That's it's it's bad data. It's not it's not good. So if you if you get if you're going to have a class available for that person, we, we could get them in we could get them in six months in advance. The truth is, and we can get their email up and running and get it activated. Well, um, we could at least get the first part of Blackboard so you can maneuver through Blackboard. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be I mean, if we have a complete packet, which is what I was going to think my next step was to do, when, when you send it over to HR, after you guys do your interviews, then you got to make your recommendation and send it to the dean. And the dean's going to have to do an interview as well, or the associate dean. Um, but if we have a course assignment, we have the two interview sheets, we got the, um, the application packet and the signed protocol. Um, my lovely staff member over here, Belinda, who you guys have brought her here so you can all become familiar with her because she's the person you're going to work with for hiring part-time faculty. I don't touch it. I don't want to touch it. I just want to know what's going on. But she makes it run smoothly for me and makes my life very, very much easier. And she's great at it. She'll get them in the system. She'll get them email. She'll get them on listserv. She'll get them Blackboard access, portal access. Um, she's your point person if you're having issues with part-time faculty. OK, um, but we could, we could get them in. It's a, it doesn't have to be, although it usually is, it doesn't have to be two weeks before the class starts. It could be, it's actually encouraged and appreciated to be three weeks to a month 
to a month and a half to two months before their class starts. Um, I'll be honest with you, nothing drives me more crazy than when I get a chair sending me an email in the middle of December because they need an instructor that's starting in January. It just it just drives it drives me nuts because it's for me even if you have instructors for all your classes I don't think there's any harm in getting a posting up even if you're not looking to hire somebody right now because what we call it in our world is we're building a pool of applicants that you have readily available should the situation arise because if it hasn't happened to you already I promise you so me and Sue deal with this all the time that people get sick. People have family members that get ill, or they just can't take their life situation changes that they have to walk away for a class. Or you get somebody who just, believe it or not, just stops showing up to class. Or people who just decide to do crazy things like change the format of a class. And I can go through a, a whole list of scenarios of reasons why we don't have people, we have to find instructors in very short periods of time. And it's good to have those types of so that pool there available to look through, um, readily available when, when those when these emergency special circumstances um, present themselves, which it does, all, I can guarantee, almost every semester for, for me and, and vice president and your deans. It's just, they come up all the time. Um, so uh, you, got, you got the interview sheets. You're going to have to complete what we call one of these faculty of credential evaluation forms. It is electronic now. Your dean's office will have all of these, but I have them as well. And this tells us, um, tells your dean and your vice president and us in their personnel file what, what their what their qualifications are and what they're qualified to teach. I can send it to you. I'll, I'll send it to Shelly and she can send it out to everybody that comes here. Any questions on this form? You have, I think you've all seen them before. Should be pretty familiar with that. And then last but not least, you need to, like I said, to get this the second interview could be scheduled with your dean. And I think you should talk with your deans on how you how they like that worked out. Whether some some deans like them to know when the interview is because then they could do it back to back. I think some might schedule a whole second interview. Um, I wouldn't. I'm not going to tell the deans how to do it. I think you need to work with them directly and what their preference is and, and talk to your dean and see how they want that second interview set up so that we could at least keep it flowing and moving in a, in a timely manner. Okay. Any questions on adjuncts? Did I miss anything? That's it. Um, and, I, and, and a lot of times what I'll say is we get a lot of emails from our chairs and our deans why is this person in the system yet? What's taking so long? I will tell you, we go as fast as the applicant goes, as, long as, 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 as responsive as the candidate is. If they want the job, I guarantee you when we get the paperwork, I'm, a, I'm willing to put my job on it that Belinda sends out an email to them and invites them within 48 hours. That's how confident I am. If they don't respond, I don't chase people. Either you're interested in the work or you're not. I don't have the time or the resources to chase people. We'll set up, we'll set up a follow-up email in a, in a day or two, but if they're not gonna if they're not gonna comply with us, I don't chase people. Sorry, plain and simple. Either they're interested in the job or they're not. And many I would say every once in a while we people, I don't want to do this. But it's it's a we put them in as quickly as they are responsive. And if they come in, they complete the paperwork, they do the background check, um, the DCFS training, which is the mandated reporter training. Listen, I don't make all these requirements. They're, these are not Joe's requirements to make it as difficult and cumbersome as possible it is for these instructors. This comes from the state legislature. So if you have a problem with it, go to Springfield. Okay, because they're the ones who put all these rules in place. I think they're good rules. I understand them, but they are cumbersome. It's a lot of work, a lot of paperwork to get into higher ed. Um, the, the DCFS training could be a good 15 to 20 minute training. People just don't want to go through the stuff, but it is what it is. And we do background checks for your safety, for the campus's safety, for the students' safety. Because every once in a while, we do get a few red flags that pop up. And then we're like, do we really want this type of individual in our classroom? 
or at least we can get an explanation of why. Um, but we, we, we move quickly. We'll move as quickly as the candidates move quickly. And um, as much as your candidate is an emergency candidate for you, there's thir how many programs do we got? So how many chair people do we got? 30, 25, 30, 35. So we're hiring for everybody. And that doesn't, that's just part time. Doesn't count the hourly, doesn't count the full timers. Um, so, and I have probably a, a team of four, okay? Four that, that, that processes all the hiring for the college. And we hire hundreds of people per year. Hundreds. So we we make everybody a priority. We turn them around really quick. And so when, we're, when we get when we get responsive people, that helps facilitate the process a lot more quickly and smoothly. Okay. Any questions on that? Am I talking about full time too? <coughs> full time? Okay. So if you're going to be hiring a full time faculty member, that starts with um, usually the deans for the RFP, right? So, so uh, Joe will get a request it's called a request for personnel form, and I will create a posting for a full time tenure track faculty member. You, as the chair, are responsible for forming what's called a hiring committee or a search committee, comprised of four to five employees that is diverse in both race and gender. And I'm going to make you put one of your administrative deans on that search hiring committee, whether it's an associate dean or a dean. Some administration will be on that committee. That'll be composed of one of your four to five, including yourself and uh, and an administrator. <clears throat> we like faculty on there because they're the experts. They know what good instructors that look like. Once you have your committee, you want to make sure you want to check what, what, what you would like it to look like. You want to verify with those individuals a couple of things. Number one, that they want to serve on the committee. Number two, they're committed to the time and work of being on the committee. No, it's not compensated. I keep have to repeat myself. I'm sorry. It's not compensated. This it, it is a commitment. It's there's meetings, there's interviews, there's reviewing applicants and resumes. And so what I don't want, what Joe does not want, is somebody that's got half foot in and half foot out. Either you're fully committed to the hiring process and doing all the work, or you're not. And a lot of times you're going to put people from your department or your school of area on there so they have a vested interest in it. So usually that's not a problem, but we want those people to make sure they're fully there. Because when I have people that are, some people are at the interviews, some people are not, some are at this interview, some are not, it creates problems multiple ones. Number one is if you, you can't agree on a, on a preferred candidate, well, some people saw one person, some people saw another person. That creates problems. Um, number two, it could potentially lead to real, real legal problems where we get um, charges of hiring discrimination, um, racial discrimination, sexual discrimination, and then I have to go and back and try to, with attorneys, um, we have to provide evidence and facts on why we hired, ended up hiring the individual that we did. It's very helpful when I have all the same people at, the, at all the interviews and the whole committee as a whole is making, a rec making recommendations. That is very beneficial for me and the college when we defend our stance on why we hired a particular individual. I'm telling you, this stuff happens. You don't know about it because we keep it quiet in my business. That's my job. That's my world. But these are real things. So you all doing things by the books is very important to me that we make things run smoothly and we do we fall in line, cross our T's and dot our I's in any hiring process. I mean you all have heard the term hiring discrimination. This is this is a real thing. So um, you do as hiring managers have a role and play an important part in um, doing things by the books and making sure things are done correctly. That's why I always say you guys, and you, none of you are, I, I know all of you, none of you guys are shy to email me, so I'm really appreciative of that. So that people are like, I can't email him. I'm not a big title guy. You guys should know. I say this wherever I go. I, I, the big title thing doesn't bother me. I'm just Joe in HR. 
I say this all the time. So if you guys have questions, email me. Okay, do not be shy to email me. I'll answer them all. I, I, I promise you. And I know my stuff. I'm really good at that. So I'll give you guys good answers. Okay. Yes, sir. Do you still send out packets? I do send out packets. Yep. And then all interviews are done on campus. All interviews are done on campus. Meetings are done on uh, meetings are done online. Interviews are done online. If people, I mean, excuse me, in person. So yeah, in, everything's done in person on campus. I have, I'll reimburse them up to 500 bucks for a trip to campus. One time. Yeah, one time. So that means if they're, if they, if they get to the second round of interviews with the VP and the president, I won't, I won't reimburse them a second time. So one time, $500. So do you guys some sort of software that can weed out resumes that are not qualified. There were some resumes that clearly this person was not qualified. Sure, sure. So, so the, the applicant tracking system has the ability, if you give me five screening questions to ask these people, do you have one of your special, whatever, your yeah. special certifications? And they say no, they won't become available for you to see. It could be all yes questions, or they have to answer yes to all these to make their application and resume available. Do you have three years teaching experience? Do you have five years um, working in a, in a hospital and in OBGYN? Whatever those things are. If they answer it, they have to meet all these things, then they'll go through. Yeah, we could, we could, we could put those in place. Those are, I, I like using them. I've been, but there's other people who don't like using them because of the fact they feel like sometimes they just want to see what's out there. So it's to each their own. I really, I, I don't have a preference one way or the other. Um, it, but yes, we can do those type of things. We can screen through those things, for sure. So you got your hiring committee. Once you get your hiring committee, everyone's, everyone's um, on board, got, they're committed. You're gonna send me the names of the people that are serving on the committee. I'm gonna make sure it meets gender, race requirements. And then I'll approve it. And then at that point in time, I'm going to give you, 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 I'm going to give you guys the link and the logging credentials to share with your committee members to begin reviewing the applicants. <clears throat> Collectively as a group, you want to adopt, identify who you want to interview, bring in the interview. There's no magic number, okay? Um, you could interview 10. Interview five. I think it's what you guys believe you need, who you believe are the most qualified for you bringing in for an interview. I will tell you that the vice president and the president like to see three finalists with every committee, if it's possible. Three. <clears throat> That's their preferred number of finalists to see. They like options. Now, with that being said, that doesn't mean for, you have to forward three names. Don't forward people that you don't want or you would not, you, you really are not recommending for hire to meet the three, the, the, to meet that magical number of three. We want three highly qualified people that you would be very happy with. But if you give me one, that's what's happened. If you give me one and then give me two subpars that you think there's no way that they would pick this one of these two, let me tell you. <laughs> They'll pick the one you think they are gonna pick. I, I'm telling you, this has happened. I, I get, they'd be like, what do you mean? I get back to the chair. I'm like, yeah, we got this person. I hired them. We're good to go. They, you think they'd be thrilled? They're like, what do you mean? This, how, how did they possibly pick this person? You, I kid you not. I kid you not. And so, um, as I'm saying, the VP and the president are bad hiring individuals. <laughs> they have their own perspective on things, but they also conduct a very different interview than you guys do. They ask very broad, high-level, 
community engagement, community involvement. How are you going to be a better, how are you going to make a difference on, you know, those type of questions are very different than the very specific questions you guys are going to ask. So while they might not be great in your interview, they might shine on this one and be better. And, and then, so that's where our paths cross. And so where we could end up getting someone that you thought they would never hire. So the goal is so if you only have two great people, then we only forward two great people. And the VP and the president can decide if they want to do an interview or not. Or they might say, no, send it back, do some more advertising, do some more interviews. Let's see if they can find a third person. So collectively identify collectively as a committee, you identify who you want to interview. You're responsible for scheduling the interviews. You guys are responsible as a committee of developing the interview questions. Those have to be approved by me, the interview questions. So make sure you guys aren't asking things you shouldn't ask. Usually it's really simple. I want to make sure you guys aren't asking some of the, although it, very rarely it does happen, but every once in a while they do. Nothing about health, someone, individual's health, their religion, their family, what are some of the no-nos, you know, those type of things. I just look for keywords. I move really quickly. I'll look it over, respond, pause, and approve. I'll just click move for public. But I think the questions that you ask are important. Don't just ask standard questions. You know, get, get into something that you ready about your field. Get into about teaching. Um, I think it's a, try, try to get an essence of not only how they are as an instructor, how they are as an employee, but also how they are as an individual without getting into too much, you know? Um, yeah. Um, do you have like a list of recommended questions? I have questions from I have questions that go back <laughs> 22 years. <laughs> I've been doing this a long time. I keep them all. So if you said, hey, do you have questions of something like this? I could pull it up. I'll go into my email and just pull it up. I have good questions. Um, but you could tweak them, whatever. I, just because it doesn't mean you can't. I could give them to you. That was used in a previous search, and you guys could tweak them to how you want. That's okay. You guys will always want to have a teaching demonstration as well. That's pretty standard. Okay. Yeah. Is there a standard number of questions that you're supposed to answer? Uh, twelve to fifteen, I think, is usually. You also don't you don't want to have a three hour interview. That's exhausting. <laughs> but I think a good hour, hour and fifty. Usually, it's like it's about a 45, 50 minute interview, a fifteen to twenty minute presentation or teaching demo. Um, but you guys, you guys are responsible with your secretary. So maybe your sometimes deans will line out their assistants to get room reservations to do the interviews, where to do those at. Make sure there's a room where they have a blackboard, uh, something like that, so you guys can teach do the teaching demo. Each of your committee members will get an interview sheet, of course, with the interviews. You want to keep track of. You save all that stuff for me. All your notes, everything gets saved. You collect it when you're done. You collect it from all your committee members, all the interview notes, everything. Send it over in a nice, pretty packet to Joe when you're done. And I stick it in a file because for about five or six years in case anything should pop up. But that's the, what you have, what you guys do is the evidence if anything should come up. Now, I have, but thankfully, knock on wood, I have not had a charge probably in a couple of years. So I'm very grateful for that. But the documentation that you all provide me mm -hmm. with these things is, the, is we trust me, we go through them, we do the scores, we see your notes at times when I have to. And that's the evidence of how we get to the point of why we ended up recommending or hiring a particular individual. And a lot of this gets into, um, a lot of this ties back where the problems tie back to is confidentiality, okay? Because you guys will, some of you will get a lot of internal applicants, people who are adjuncts that want full-time gigs, and they believe that they are the best no matter what you say. They could be good instructors. But the, they can't fathom the idea that somebody off the street could potentially come in and be a better fit as a full-time instructor than they were who's been doing this for three to four to five years. They may be good. They may be good. They just may not be better than this particular person. And, you know, you, you, you all took these jobs because the idea of tenure track and having tenure and being a full-time professor here at the college is great. A lot of these adjuncts have those aspirations as well. And when things don't work out for them, they are devastated. I mean that. And so when when committee members talk, oh, well, we interviewed this person and they did so and so, and that's where the problems create. 
So one of your roles, and when I will meet with each of you when you have a high full-time track, we, we do this all over again, I force you to meet with me. I stress the importance of confidentiality. And we don't talk about it. We don't talk about the interview questions. We don't talk about who we're interviewing. We don't talk about who we recommended. It is like classified, top secret. We don't say a thing. Because talking just creates rumors. And rumors just spread and gossip just creates which is just it's like a toxic poison that just seeps through the department or the individuals and we try to work but if no one can talk and if nobody knows anything then, then that doesn't happen people's feelings don't get hurt and they just find out through me and my department that thank you but you're not up here and you're not up for the job okay. any questions Big responsibility. It is, but I'll answer any questions you guys have. You will shoot to ask me. Do we have to interview employers that are from Triton or No, no, no. You do not. Um, the committee as a whole collectively has to identify who they want to interview. We don't do courtesy interviews at the college. And basically, is what you're asking. Do we do do courtesy interviews? The only the only collective bargaining agreement that has courtesy interviews is the full time faculty bargaining is the full time faculty contract. If they are um, minimally qualified for any job on campus, we have to give them an interview for the job. <clears throat> Is there a formal follow-up to everyone who's, let's say, interviewed for the tenure track and they do not get a position? Yeah. Every, everyone who does not get a full-time job at this college gets an email correspondence from me letting them know they're no longer considered for the job. And that's after the first round of interviews? No, that's after I've hired someone. <laughs> after someone's accepted the employment offer. Because what happened? Those who have gone through the first round. No, everybody who's applied. Everybody's applied. It's a it's a letter. It's in it's a, a brief. It's a, it's a it's a it's a quick note saying thank you for applying. Um, you're very you, your credentials were very impressive. Unfortunately, we decided to hire another candidate that meets the that meets what we're really looking for. This is something I wrote up that my secretary sent out on my behalf. Um, I can't. I don't want to write a personal note to every I, number one. I can't a personal note to everyone that's applied. Um, and I don't get into why they didn't get the job. It's just, it's a rabbit hole that I'm not willing to go down because they, they no matter what I say, it's never good enough. And so, um, and it limits liability. My job is to limit the liability of the organization and the college. And any, whatever you say, they're gonna interpret it some way the way they want it to be interpreted. And so that's just not, a, that's not, that's not a world that I'm willing to live in. There, there's no good that can come out of it. If they want resources on how to do better interviews, we can refer them to career services or other agencies. Um, if they, but it's another reason why we don't do we don't do uh, reference we don't do references at the college. Why? Because there's liability of that. You know, we, we do what's called verifications of employment. So if someone is, comes to you guys and says, "Hey, will you write me a, a, a reference letter?" The answer is no. You could write them a personal one as Kelly. Okay. But not as Kelly, the chairperson of what are you doing again? Can I ask? Right? Respiratory. Respiratory, there you go. Um, <clears throat> you don't do it in that capacity because in that capacity you're representing the college. And um, if if that reference ain't good enough or is interpreted in some other way, uh, you may think it was well intended, because they're gonna ask you, well, what are the weaknesses? You know, if you get a reference call from somebody, what are her weaknesses? Where does she need to develop or he need to develop better? You, you may have your opinions, but at the, first of all, do you know they're not that whether they're going to share that with the individual, the other employer, or the organization? <clears throat> no, we don't. We don't. We don't go down that rabbit hole. It's just that there's too too much liability there in today's day and age where we don't take those type of risks. So if somebody wants a verification of employment, my staff will do that. Dates, hourly wage, salary, positions held, courses taught, all that type of stuff, we'll do. But strengths, weaknesses, we don't do that. How does that apply to students that ask for recommendations? Uh, yeah, that's okay. We could, yeah, as representatives, 
the That's okay. Student, yeah, student, yes. Unless the dean's put some rule in, but in my world, I, 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 I've not had any issues with that. I know, prof, I know instructors do it, so no, there, we, I, we haven't had any issues with that. No. So uh, versus employment. Employment. Versus yeah. Student. yeah, students are okay. Yeah. Employment. Yeah. It's not like I want to control everything you guys do, but the, my, the, the, the problem is when things go wrong, they end up on my desk. And so that's that's just the way it is. And so we put and these things are in place when I inherited this job 20 years ago. And so it's just it's 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 worked well. Uh, we've made some tweaks and things, but some things we just we can't put on. But yeah, everybody gets a notice. Everybody from me. I will for certain people, just who I know have been here a long time or had a lot on it. I'll pick up the phone call and make a phone call and say it and, and talk some people through some things. Uh, just let them know why we're going in a different direction, why we didn't think this was a good fit. It's not playing favorites, but you know, people who've been here for people sometimes in certain positions and certain lengths of time in military service deserve a little more than just uh, a generic email from Joe's second assistant. And so I pick up the phone and make a technical call. Yes, they'll still get the general email, but I'll follow up with a phone call saying, hey, you know, because I think they're owed that respect. Once you're on a committee, hiring committee, are you always on that hiring committee? Through the end of the search. But no, then if, if you had a whole nother, let's say you had a whole nother position to fill, then no, you don't have to be on that. But um, until the position's filled, yes, you're on that committee. I mean, you could step away in theory. We'd replace it, but we, we sometimes we mix it up if we think that we just need a new set of eyes. Sometimes you, you just have a different perspective come in. We'll mix it up once in a while, but for the most part, the committee's the committee. They see it through to the very end. And sometimes they go for a while. Sometimes people don't, because we, they don't. And in, especially in your guys' world, and you know this already, that <clears throat> trying to get people to understand the job is, is not easy. It's like, oh yeah, I teach, right? <laughs> Well, so it's a lot more than just teaching students. I mean, and they don't understand compensation. And, and you know, LHE and base load and overload and release time and stipends and extra duty assignments and not contractual extra duty assignments. <clears throat> Trying to get you guys to office hours, right? It's 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 complicated to explain. And so trying to understand that world on top of everything um, is is not easy. And so you guys make this recommendation. I go to try to hire the individual, number one. Um, our, our, our salaries are competitive, but they're, they're not out of this world, <coughs> okay? And for some fields, you know, uh, and I just use health careers. You, you go to the health careers, they'll make seventy-five, eighty thousand dollars $80,000, probably coming right out of college. Give a number. The, I, I'm not paying somebody that money when they come here to teach. The two primary drivers of our salary and education here at the college and the collective bargaining room for full-time faculty is your education, which 90% are topped out at a master's degree. Okay, not that you can't get more, but most but most of my applicants for full-time faculty have a master's degree. The master's degree, which placed them in column one, and then and then teaching experience. How much I offer you is teaching is based on teaching experience, not experience in the field. But teaching experience those are the two driving factors for full-time faculty salary and a lot of people don't have a very limited full-time teaching experience let me let me add that other category not just teaching experience full-time equivalency teaching experience so column one for faculty you know there's four columns masters masters plus 30 masters plus 60 and phd right or doctor um you move those as you as you accumulate the the, the credits um, most are only in column one most are only in column one or column four, the doctorate or the master's plus one. Very few are in between. Um, and so the PhDs are looking, uh, you're looking to 70 to $80,000 range per, as a base load for 30 LAG. And your, your, your column one are 52 to 55. So they can get up to 70,000 if they teach max load 24 per semester, they probably get another 18, $20,000 um, per semester. But um, trying to get them to understand that, you guys know that I don't, I don't, 
promise overload to anyone. It's just it's it's it's, not, it's, it's based on availability, and so I I'll only tell you what your base salary is going to be, which is your 15 in the fall and your 15 in the spring. That's it, and you could get more than that. You can make more money, but also more money means more work, right? More time in the classroom, more office hours. So there's a I mean, it seems obvious, but it's sometimes the work that you're getting is a lot more work than you're actually doing in the field when you guys were out somewhere else. And so that's just doing all this and I'm just making what I was making then when I was doing 25 less hours per week. But you do it because you love it, right? We love it. That's why. Not the reality, but but I've had the you guys all know we've had these conversations, right? We've all been there. We, I know you guys. We've done we've done these conversations with almost all of you, but we do it because we love it. And um, the great thing about education is it, it, the longer you're here, it pays off in the end. You start getting column movement, the salaries go up, and there's all these other opportunities to make a lot of additional compensation. And then you become experts at what you're doing. Not that you guys aren't experts, but it takes a year. I told you, I think I almost tell you every one of you, it takes a full year to go through the whole cycle to become really familiar with what you're doing here, to be very comfortable, a full year. <laughs> so what else have we got? Anything else? It's a lot, right? The good news is you can always email Joe, and you can always stop by and see me. And if you do hire full-time faculty, I will absolutely meet with you one-on-one -on -one before I let you run loose and run wild. Um, and if you have hiring questions about adjuncts, you can, you can always come to me. But Belinda's great. So please, I encourage to share the wealth of communications to HR, to Belinda, and the rest of my staff. Okay? Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll help you out as, as much as we can. Okay? But you guys are all been doing great. So keep up the good work. Okay, thanks guys. That's it. Come on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I know we heard HR's perspective, which is great. I'm going to invite Dean Barkley to add anything from on hiring from Dean's perspective, and then we'll take on a few minutes about the evaluation of the chairs. So um, add anything. I think my panel you know, adds really around the adjunct hiring, and like I see, you already started to put some changes to the top sheet, which is fine. Um, the way we go to arts and sciences is a lot easier when the packet comes to the Dean's office already completed. So that we have everything we need to read before we interview the adjunct um, instructor. If we, if you don't feel that that person is qualified from that credential sheet, then we should not be interviewing that person. They have to be qualified. So that's why we're asking that you do that before it comes to us. Your um, interview um, question sheet should come to us as well. And if you have um, concerns about the instructor but you still want to hire them. Make sure it's on your interview form, and then also talk to whoever's going to interview for your dean's office. Make sure you talk to them to let them know what your concerns are. Because you have concerns doesn't mean you won't hire, you won't hire them, but we need to know how to support that person if we decide to hire them, right? So you may say they've never taught before, but I think they may be great in the classroom. So we may start out by saying, you know what, we're going to put a plan in place to have a mentor assigned to them from our department so that they're successful when they first start. Right, so we need to know what your concerns are, if there are any. If you feel the person's great, also tell us that, so that we are looking for those same things when we interview. Um, there are times when we may waive the interview from the dean's office for adjuncts. Most of the time we don't, but every blue moon we may we may waive if it's um, an adjunct we had before and they left for two or three years and they're coming back and they go through the process again, we may waive that interview at our level. We still expect you all to do it, just so you know what you're getting back, right? But then you still fill out the form, we get it, we may waive it, but not so much time we're not, because we want to know who uh, you all are interested in as well. Um, that's it. Oh, the top form, what we do in um, our sciences, you can change this how you need to at your, um, in your school, but what we do is we have a chair to take the top part, and it comes along with a packet of the pedestrian form, the post, interview form, and what's the other form in here? Oh, the uh, online, the online credentials. When that comes to us, we have the full packet. We know uh, there's a section on here that you, you, you should have on your form. 
it's the course assignment and start date. Joe already said that you can't hire anyone if you don't have a course to put them in. So you need to list what the course or courses are and the start date, which would be the start date of the semester that they're going to be teaching. If we get this and it doesn't have that, then the assumption is that you're not you're not ready to hire them. So make sure that's on there. That's important. Uh oh. Yeah. <laughs> if we're trying to generate or create a pool yeah. of potential adjuncts, then how are we how are we to do that without being inside? So I hear what you yeah. So the idea of pool doesn't really exist here. So when Joe mentioned pool, what he's referring to is when they apply in the portal, <clears throat> that's your pool. So you have applications sitting there that you can go back to as often, hopefully as often as you can. But in terms of like having a, a pool of people that you've interviewed already, we really don't need that. That, that doesn't mean you can't, but the, I guess the issue with that is when you interview, they're expecting to open the offer of position. I guess what you can say is, we're just interviewing because you may have position, but we're not sure we have position. So, an example, <clears throat> even with nursing, um, if we have an adjunct or a position to fill, and then we need someone immediately, it's like us being on call, what they call PRN, right? Uh, available as needed. So, if I have a last second need, I don't want to have to go and delay if I've already processed and interviewed and I've got this person approved to put into a classroom quickly. So you, you don't do that? Are you understand what he's asking? So I think when he's what he's asking, so, well, I'll let you. So um, radiography has an adjunct, right? And at the last minute, we're notified that there was a shift change, and this person that we had adjunct can't perform their duties with us. If I had a pool of pre approved, I've already interviewed applicants. Is that Joe coming back? Yeah, perfect. Joe. Uh, <laughs> perfect. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, question There it is. So I was asking, so radiography as an action of teaching assigned to this course. And we're a week out or two weeks out and we get notification, Nancy's told by this person that, hey, I had a shift change, I'm no longer available. How can I pull from this pool without having to go through the entire process? So really, why can't we interview up front and have them like pre-approved so that we can quickly pull it into the game? Because you're saying that we can't do anything unless you have an assignment already pre-made. I won't put them in college. I can do. I'm willing to do the paperwork, and we'll put a folder on the side. But I'm not putting them in. I'm not putting them into college. And so it's like well, it's, I, I could have all. I could have their tax forms done. Okay. I could have their. They could do their DCFS training done. They could have the application and cover interviews to be completed. I don't have a problem doing that. But I'm not going to put that. I just because then when we run reports, which we submit to ICC, right. these right. people pop up and they're like, "Well, why are they in the system if they don't work?" Right. And so, what we do get just so you know, we get the, the auditors mm -hmm. when we do our annual audit. They look through everybody who's in this in, in our who has access to our administrative system. And if they haven't, they've never worked, or if they are, if they have access to portal, email, um, our active system. They write a management letter to us, yeah. which gets us in some big trouble. That we have these people who aren't really employees having access to our system. Yeah. And so I'll do everything, but entering in the system and getting them access takes her five minutes. But I'll, I can do everything up to that one. Up though. to that point. So we can interview three or four people, have yes. them on standby. Um, no, but yeah. <laughs> right. but you should, but you should also, yeah, that, that, that's absolutely an option. But also, you should see it. Make sure if any of your other adjuncts are are, are, are available yeah. and have load space available to add on to them, it's right. another great option. Wow. Yeah, we can do that. That's okay. Good. And we've done that before, where she she holds on to them to the side, 
you know, for whatever reason, they, they, they couldn't do it this semester. She, or, but we, yeah, we, we usually have, we, we, can do, we can do all that stuff, for sure. So All right. Thank you. All right. Well, we got a few more points to go. Now that you've hired your, and we're going to attack today the non tenured so basically your full time faculty. What happens after you've hired them successfully? <clears throat> well, our responsibilities do not stop. In fact, it increases. And you play a big role. So I created a slide, wanted to make sure that we don't miss any point. You have a very big responsibility in guiding and mentoring, unofficially mentoring, and making sure your non-tenured faculty is able to get to that finish line. Finish line. I shouldn't even say finish line, but to make sure that they get tenure, right? Um, so how many of you are familiar with the tenure process? No? That could be another full session on the whole tenure time. Let's, we'll not take up on that time on that. Just, just want to make sure, and this always comes up about Timely completion of duties and deadlines, and I'm going to let Dean Bartley in a few minutes give her perspective. Their deans are the ones that are finally approving your non-tenured faculty for renewal of contracts, as well as for tenure, tenure recommendation. CD plays a critical role in supporting your faculty. Uh, we meet monthly, and there's, again, if you look at tenure guidelines, which are also posted on CT SharePoint page, certainly I can send it to you and also post it on your Blackboard uh, page, um, but there's a number of things that a uh, number of deliverable that your non-tenured faculty will go through in these five semester. Okay, where does your responsibilities come as a chairperson for your new faculty, right? So there are certain. I'm going to give you more forms. Um, yes, forms the more. So let's talk about a few things. Um, there are a number of expectations. You will be working closely with your new faculty in filling out their forms. One of the ones that applies to you yourself is your classroom observation. Right? I'm sure you get observed, but then you also observe uh, your non-tenured faculty every semester until they get their tenure, okay? This is the same form. I don't have copy for that. It's a very long, but it's the same form that you get observed. It's the same for adjunct and uh, full-time faculty classroom observations. So you make sure that you complete their classroom observations on time. If there's any dean who wants to chime in, the importance of timely completion, okay? The deans need their packet on time every, as soon as possible would be our recommendation. I tell them all their needs. First thing I tell them, yes, they are responsible, they're guiding, they're mentoring. Um, but who wants tenure? Whoever wants tenure should be proactive. And if you haven't, I mean, everybody's busy. Deans are busy, chairs are busy. I always say, reach out to them. If you haven't heard anything about scheduling a classroom observation, you reach out and say, I haven't heard. Can I get on your calendar? Can I schedule? Right? So this is um, their responsibility. But just so you are aware, um, I just think not only the classroom observation, but the self-evaluation. Correct. Correct. Self-evaluation. So classroom observations have been completed, but I'm still waiting for a lot. Okay. A lot, lot of, yeah. And there are many components, right? Yes, yeah, Dina. So again, this is arts and sciences. Every school can do it differently. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next semester. Yeah, you can do it differently. But in arts and sciences, I require that um, the self-assessment form gets to me before we schedule the pre mm -hmm. I want to be able to read through what you're saying your teacher philosophy is. I want to read through how you're saying you're assessing your students. I want to read through your reflections of your practice before we have a conversation about what I'm going to see in your classroom. So if I schedule the, the pre-brief conversation on October 11th, at least a week or so before that, I need your self-assessment form completed. I'm reading that, we have our pre-brief, we talk about maybe a little of that, you tell me what you want me to focus on in your observation, and then we schedule the observation. After the observation, then we have our conversation, and I'm going back to that self-assessment that you completed, right? Because if you told me my teaching philosophy or my pedagogy is that I'm engaging and I do a lot of hands-on, 
and I see your observation and you talk two hours and 45 minutes, you're contradicting yourself, right? So then that's part of the conversation we're having in our, in our um, debrief conversation. So again, your school can determine, your deans can determine how you do that. It is working for us in our office. If we don't get the self-assessment form before the pre brief we cancel the observation until we get the documentation. And so it's become a practice in, in our department that that's what we do. And it, it, it was bumpy at first, but now it's, it's a, almost smooth for the most part. <laughs> almost. Great, Ben. As far as my area, it's really bumpy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's like landing in your hair yesterday. So we're learning that we're learning. But the sooner the better. The sooner the better. Okay, that's what we heard. And the area is so much. And if, if we understand it's a lot on your plate, and if there are questions, I'm here about the form. I know some form got revised this time. The self-assessment got, you know, that's a different uh, updated uh, observation. Anything you can reach out to me. Certainly the deans are there, but you can always reach out to me first. But timely completion, because there are that, and they're looking and waiting for the report for your non tenure Okay, so semester classroom observation, as soon as possible, I send the same message to the faculty. Faculty evaluation form is the one I just passed out. That also needs to be completed, again, as soon as possible. Um, you will also be chairing the mentoring committee. We call it committee, but you can call it group. I mean, maybe committee is okay, but there's no requirement to meet frequently. I think it's important that you are in touch with your non group faculty, making sure that you're um, answering their question, but there is supposed to be a mentoring committee that's comprised of their mentors. They get two mentors, your non tenured faculty, right? One from your school, one from outside school. With those two, and the chair of the department comprised, and the faculty comprised of that whole mentoring committee. Charlotte, really, the, the, yes? Before you jump to the next one. Yeah. Um, for the mentoring committee, you're supposed to mm -hmm. set up a meeting with your um, senior track faculty. Yeah. First semester, third semester, fifth semester. Right? So at the end of first semester, because it's their first semester, you want to give them feedback how they're doing. Then you give them a year. So then at the end of the third semester, you're having another committee meeting where it's the uh, you're talking to the um, the team track person. And then fifth semester, that's when we're um, sending recommendations for tenure. So you definitely want to make sure you're having that conversation with them at the end of the fifth semester. Evaluation. We still have to do all that stuff to complete out that sixth semester. We've had it since I've been here where people are like, oh no, I'm tenured. I don't need to do the rest of stuff. No, you still need to do it. You got to complete that sixth semester. The only thing that becomes optional in the sixth semester is their monthly meetings. You want to take that load off. It's optional. They can still invite it. But the monthly meeting, the purpose is to help them get the tenures, all the things that they need, a professional development, and all of that. So we make that optional. But yeah, we might do that to the rest of the paperwork. And this is not the first time you're meeting. Once you have your non tenured faculty, there will be some communication going out from the CT, from the deans, etc. Right? I just want to make sure we've at least touched upon the key roles and the key responsibilities of the chair, you being in the new position. So there's a mentoring committee. You're supporting them until your faculty get tenured. Uh, your recommendation for renewal of contracts and tenure. Uh, again, first semester. So first semester, third semester, third semester, you are writing a letter to your dean to say, I recommend that um, Justina uh, gets mm -hmm. gets renewal for the next academic year. And you're giving some points of why you say that, right? First semester, third mm -hmm. semester, fifth semester. And that comes to your dean. Yes. If you are your own chair, how does that work? Like I'm the only faculty member in court, I'm also the chair. So does that, does the dean's office just worry about that? The dean's office will just do it. You wouldn't do one. 
Okay, you're not writing one of us out. I would be overly critical. Well, this is all that means. No, it'll just be your name in that case. Because we have that in our school as well. Yeah. I think every school has a chair for also new faculty. Yeah. Yeah, I think I just want to make sure that I was listening to the last time. And I will add this. Um, yeah. If you have concerns about your faculty member, yeah. don't wait until it's time to write that letter. Don't wait until it's time to have your committee meeting. You should be having those conversations with your faculty ahead of time, but you need to make sure your dean is aware. I absolutely will get on my chairs if they come to me at the end of third or fifth semester and say, oh, I have been worried about this person for the last year and a half. That's the first time I've heard of it. We're going to have a problem. You have to make sure your faculty is aware, right, because they need to be able to make changes, but your dean has to be aware. Because it ultimately comes down to us saying yes or no to renewal, and I don't want to say I'm renewing, then my chair gives me a letter and says, oh, this person sucks. And it's like, well, you haven't told me anything. Right, so we don't want that to happen. That brings me to the last one, exactly what Dean Bartley said. Please work closely with the deans. Keep them in the loop about everything, right? You, and again, this is about your chair roles, about your faculty concerns, accomplishments, everything, because all of this goes in your decision, your dean's decision, in approval of contract, in all of contract, as well as the tenure. I know chair play a key role in recommending tenure, um, right, and your, your Approval, your recommendation carry a lot of weird when they approve, again, your new faculty for either renewal of contracts or tenure. So just keep that in mind. Um, so five points, let me see if I'm, and again, as I said, this is not the first time you're doing it. Your new faculty will have a lot of support from, uh, from the CT, because there are obviously there's a lot of things, a lot of things that they have to manage. And we're constantly learning and evolving. It's like, oh yeah, the tenure project would be good to have a template. Because so someone said, well, the project, you know, um, how do I write it? What does it mean? mean? What do I, is there a document? Is there a form? So, yeah, we can create a form, right? So we are always looking for your ideas, for you know, your new faculty's ideas. So we give them all tools and resources. This is just a sample for this time, just so they can keep. All the things, as I said, there are a lot of things to keep track. More that you have it. You guys all have it. So they get a calendar like this. This is a sample. They can keep track of everything. And I do say this is not the only item, this is not exhaustive. There are other things outside, but as far as keeping track of items due by month, which starts from, let's say, scheduling observation. I tell them to do that in August. Now, some may not take action. <laughs> I can only answer. I can only tell, suggest, recommend. But but uh, I always touch base on that in every monthly meeting. OK, by now, it's literally like teaching a class. By now, you should have heard from the dean or go back to the chair, and, you know, do this, do that. But just so you know, and any ideas or thoughts you may have to make it more robust so that but, your faculty feel supported and they know what's expected. I'm, I'm here to support you. That. So, calendar, evaluations, observations, and um, again, they're looking out for your guidance in um, getting to that mark of you know getting a tenure. Questions on that part? Just the non tenure faculty support, guidance, all of these forms. Anything I can answer for you, or Dean Bartley can answer from Dean's perspective, or other things. The question comes to DJ Child. I'm not sure about the deadline. When is everything due? You know, what's your role with your support? All right, if there are no questions, then I think do you have anything else? No? Other teams? Anything? No? Okay, well, all right. Teamwork, teamwork. Yes, Tracy, uh, she has an announcement. Hi, Tracy, you don't know me. I'm Tracy Wright. I am. 